Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Edward Castronova, an associate professor in the Department of Telecommunications at Indiana University. He is an expert on the economies of large-scale online games and has numerous publications on that topic. His latest is a book, Exodus to the Virtual World. Ted, welcome to Econ Talk. Oh, thanks, Russell. It's really great to be here. Well, our topic for today is the ideas uh, that are in that book, Exodus to the Virtual World, and there are a lot of ideas in the book. It's extremely thought-provoking. And it's rare to come across a book that argues that something that you know nothing about is going to change the world in so many ways. You're either a genius or very strange, probably both. Uh, so <laughs> exactly. you're, you'll probably take both, won't you? Yeah. So let's start with some background. What are sure. these large-scale online games that you discuss in the book, and why are they important? Well, okay, so this is the crazy part. Let's start with crazy. Imagine you know, you're playing a video game. I'm sure a lot of the listeners have seen people playing video games or played them themselves. And, you know, it involves like a screen and you look and you see a fantasy place with dragons and and then, you know, your nephew is the character in the middle running around after the dragon. Well, what's happened is that same basic format has been um, set up on a, a central computer, like a central server that, you know, the nephew logs into. And what's funny about it is like other people log in at the same time. So you've got this world now sitting on a computer and you might watch, you know, somebody playing this video game. It looks like a normal video game. There's the dragon. There's the warrior or whatever. And then all of a sudden you start seeing other characters running around attacking the dragon. And those things are not like part of the video game. Those are being run by other people. So from the standpoint of somebody outside of this technology, at first it looks like just a normal thing. But it, the crazy part is it it's like it becomes a virtual world. It sort of persists on that server. People can log in from anywhere, and they can chat with one another. Now they can do voice over IP, so they can talk to one another. And instead of it being, you know, a conversation at the bus stop, like when's the next bus coming, they're standing around waiting for a, a Zeppelin or something. When's the next Zeppelin? And, and so it's a very normal social environment, except it's in this fantastic, um, persistent world. And these things are about... Well, I mean, they go back to the 1970s, very sort of nerdy fringe of this started it in the 70s. And what's happened in the last five or six years is they've gotten really, really sophisticated and fast and graphically intense. And as a result of that, we've now got, you know, not dozens of people in these places, but millions, and it's happening really, really fast. So that's then the serious part. Anytime you work in the economy and you see something go from nothing to millions of people in the space of five years, you know, that that's when you got to kind of look at it and take it kind of half seriously. So that's more or less what I'm doing. Well, a lot of us out here in the uh, non-virtual world, which I I think for purposes of um, just for jargon in this conversation, I'm going to call it the real world. Let's do that. Yes, so, so the flesh and blood world where you can, where when the, the dragon eats you and you don't come back to life, <laughs> that's the real world, the world that we're conducting this podcast in. Right. But um, those of us out here in the real world – most of us don't play those games, don't know anything about them. We, we might have heard of one or two of them. Uh, two of the more prominent ones you discuss in the book are World of Warcraft and Second Life. I've heard of them vaguely, but I don't know much about them. And, and so you said, well, they're, they're growing. You claim there's millions of people playing them? Yeah. Tell me about that, and then tell me their economic significance. And by economic, I actually mean financial, the traditional right. meaning of the word economic or the economy. Yeah, so let's talk about business models. Let's start with the first one, World of Warcraft. As I said, you know, this is a persistent environment that lives on a computer. To get access to that environment, you pay the company $15 a month. You, gotta, you actually got to go buy the game at the store, so that's 50 bucks. And then you have to log in. You have to sign up and get an account, $15 a month. And then you can play in the environment all you want for uh, the next 30 days, the next month. So the number of people who are currently saying, yeah, that's a good deal, I want to do that, is, get this, more than 9 million people around the globe just in that one game. So if you do the math on that, we're talking 
hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue for the owning company, which is Blizzard Entertainment, it's owned by Vivendi. Um, just and just it's just coming in, and all they got to do is keep a server running, or keep you know the hundreds of servers that they have, you know, doing the game. But that's like a really m- small uh, marginal cost for them. And so this is just basically pure revenue at this point. They've long since recouped their development costs, and they've got this massive um, flow of money. So and those development costs were significant. Yeah, I mean, it's $75 million or so to develop a game like that. It's like, think major motion picture. But, I mean, think about it. You, know, you develop a major motion picture, and this thing gets 9 million people to pay 15 bucks a month for years. You know, they just, it's like keep watching it over and over again, yeah, but, but they don't yeah, they don't own it. Right. They, and, and they um you know, and this this game was launched in November of two thousand four and here it is almost two thousand eight and it's going strong, like I said, these nine million people around the globe. Um and so And that's just one. And that's just one. So and, and, but what's interesting, what's nice for me about World of Warcraft is you can actually identify what's going on. You've got people signing a contract and sending a check every month. So now here's now comes Second Life. Second Life is not a game environment. It's more of a 3D immersive environment for people to go in and you can like make anything you want. So the company that owns that is called Linden Lab. They just made a tool so that people could log into a server and then kind of manipulate the objects there and make anything you want. And they have, you know, I think 9 or 10 million people who have signed up for a free account. So it's not the same thing as paying 15 bucks a month. Sign up for a free account go in, make whatever you want, and it turns out that people have gone in and made thousands of square miles of content, you know, pagodas and office buildings and racetracks and casinos and, you know, God knows what else. It's like a Wild West, all made by the users, not made by the company. And then the way the company makes money is if you want to actually build something, um, that's when you, you have to, like, buy land. So the company's making money hands over hand over fist by by selling islands, basically for people to build stuff on. But you can walk through that world at no cost and enjoy yeah. the buildings that other people made, and chat yeah. with other people at the casino, or do whatever you want. Free account, and in fact, you know, your presence is what drives the economics of that place. Because let's say I made some place, some island, you know, the island of Ted and Russell, and of course everyone wants to go there. So all the people who sign up for free, they all go to the island of Ted and Russell and learn about economics and whatever. And because of that, that island gets what's called a lot of dwell. So it's a statistic measuring you know, frequency of population. And it goes up in the search engine for Second Life, and then we could put advertisements on our island because you know people would come, and a lot of people would hear about it and so on and so Who forth. Who captures the dwell increase? The, they have statistics measuring like, how many people... Um, um, are actually there? You mean who captures it statistically? Do I, do I profit? No, do I profit from that? If would you and yeah. I profit from that directly? Yeah, do, not directly. You do indirectly. So you, let's say you're selling some service. Let's say you and I designed a flower that people can put on their islands. And in order to get the word out about this flower, it's nice to have high dwell because then people go, hmm, well, what's a good flower place? And we're up at the top of the search engine because of our high dwell. So that's how they. And then it. we would sell that. Uh, that flower for real money or pretend money? You sell it for pretend money, Linden dollars, and then you can take the Linden dollars and you can sell them for real money on an open market that they have. And where, are the, where is that open market? In Second Life or in, elsewhere? Uh, I think it's on the web. It might be in Second Life. You know, I don't know exactly how you access it. Um, you can access the web from within Second Life, so I don't think it matters what the actual delivery technology is, but it's the thing called the Lindex, the Linden dollar exchange. Well, the thing that really fascinated me when you and I talked about this in the past is the is that interface between these virtual worlds and the real world where people are buying stuff in the real world and it's virtual world stuff. Yeah. So somebody who earns uh, – who builds a nice house in uh, Second Life could sell right. it to a newcomer and get real money or right. someone who earns a wand or a sword – or some kind of trophy or medal in World of Warcraft is able to sell it on eBay for real money, correct? Yeah. yeah Explain that and, and give us an idea uh, about the magnitudes of these transactions because I was quite surprised. So that kind of trade has been going on for probably uh, 10 years, um, and it has been come to be considered pretty normal. Almost every game that gets launched, every world that gets launched, puts in a currency because it turns out the economy is fun. You can't have a world without an economy because it's boring. 
which is interesting in and of itself. We'll probably talk about that later. So all these worlds have economies. It means they all have money in them. And um, it, this trade always develops. So the money in the world is, and, and the equipment is used to do something. So in Second Life, you, know, you need a, a motorcycle to go fast or a pretty house. Um, gee, how do I get that pretty house? Well, I could go in and build it myself, which would take a whole bunch of hours. And I'm a, you know, I'm an associate professor with two little kids. I don't have time to build a big pagoda. So, um, gee, maybe I want to buy one. Well, to buy one, I got to get Linden dollars. How do I get Linden dollars? And then there's all this work you can do to get Linden dollars. That takes forever. I don't want to do that. So you go to the Lindex and you say, I'm going to take my real money and use it to buy the currency that gives me purchasing power over the things I want. Um, and, and it's that way in all of them. So in World of Warcraft, you would take real money. You, like, let's say you go to eBay, and there's a, an auction there for World of Warcraft gold pieces, 1,000 gold pieces for $200. And you look at that and you say, okay, I, that's worth it, you know, 1,000 gold pieces. I need to buy a magic wand or a horse or something. Who doesn't? <clears throat> right. So you, so, and, and then the transaction goes just like as if you bought a Hummel figurine or something on eBay. You send them the check in real money, and then they got to deliver the goods to you, right? And, yeah, how do and, they do that? Well, you trust them because there's a trust ranking in eBay. That works the same. And in order to actually do the delivery, you go into the virtual world, and uh, you log in your character, and the other guy logs in his character, and he actually runs up and says, okay, here you go. Here's 1,000 gold pieces inside the world. So um, now usually they do it in a secret way because that's actually illegal from the standpoint of the rules of the World of Warcraft. The Second Life loves it. They love this trade, but World of Warcraft really, really hates it. So... Um, uh, but that, but it happens the same way in both places. There's I assume world delivery. World of Warcraft doesn't like it because it's some, it's cheating. It doesn't, it doesn't represent a, merit, a meritocracy within the game. Is that why? Yeah, I mean, the, the fantasy games are set up so that, um, you know, it's like kind of the dream economy. What if we all started with nothing, and then you know we got to choose whether or not we wanted to make a lot of money, so that the people who ended up with a lot of money, hey, it was just their choice, and you know, and I'm happy not having so much money because I spent my time doing other things. That's sort of the, the dream. It's sort of the Horatio Alger um, economy. And it gets screwed up if, you know, some kid is super powerful at level two just because his dad's a lawyer and, you know, and he has access to the credit card. So he buys 100 million gold pieces and is an immediate rich person. You know, that, that's kind of too much like reality. So it takes away from the fun of the game. And, you know, and... and um, I think it's up to anybody who makes a game to set the rules however they want. So, like, if I'm playing Monopoly, I don't want to play Monopoly with people who strike a side deal. I'll give you 50 U.S. dollars for a boardwalk. You know, that makes Monopoly less fun. Exactly. So, yeah, no, that's a great that's a great analogy. So, so how much – what's the magnitude of these so, economic trans, these financial transactions? Well, you know, I can't answer that. I can give you some guesses. So, yeah. And um, the reason I can't answer it is because, like your earlier question, how many people – after World of Warcraft and Second Life, you know, after that type of game, we, we're starting to lose our handle on where this phenomenon is and how big it is. So it becomes really hard to say how much trade there is. The last set of solid numbers that I saw indicated that this trading of, of real dollars for gold pieces was more than a billion dollars a year around the world. A billion. Now, yeah, a billion people. dollars in the, in the world economy is a very small number. Yeah. But... For a brand new phenomenon that most, again, I suspect most of us had never heard of, right. it's astounding. And in fact, it's not even that you haven't heard of it, it's that it's so weird. Yeah. No, it's real <laughs> different. It's real different. And it, it, It's sort of like, you know, people are spending a billion dollars for pet rocks. That's your initial reaction. Right. To it. And when I, when I talk to people about your book, which I started to when I, a week or so ago when I started reading it, they look at me with a look of... of combination of bemusement and uh, skepticism. You got it. Come on, people aren't really spending real money to buy a house in a virtual world, yeah. uh, but they are. And as you point out, people are spending dozens, hundreds, and thousands of hours exploring these worlds, killing dragons, building houses, uh, going to the next level, etc. Yeah, I mean... There are two ways to sort of square this circle. I mean, first you have to look at the virtual world and say, what's going on there isn't so weird. I mean, it's a real human society with all of the origin of value issues there, like reputations and hierarchy and conspicuous consumption and value and use. All, that, all that's pretty real. But then I think what really helps people is to step back and, and think about how much virtual stuff in the real world 
trades for a lot of money. So like, uh, you know, www.harvard.edu is a non-traded virtual good. But I know it has economic value. And the reason I know is that if they ever gave it to me, I'd put a website up there that would make them negotiate in earnest about giving me money to get it back. Yeah. You know? Right, it doesn't so, exist. There's no nothing really called. Yeah. You can't touch it. Right. And you know, if you think about our real money, you know, why why does anybody accept a real $1 bill in return for this Diet Coke? We don't tell anyone that. We're yeah. not supposed to let on that that's a problem. <laughs> but yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. Or right, just a green piece of paper. So it's sort of, if you say, okay, the virtual stuff is actually a little bit more real than you might think, and then you say, well, the real stuff is a little bit more virtual than you might think, and then you see, okay, it, it makes, I mean, I may not do it myself just as, you know, I don't really care about the Hope Diamond as a thing itself, but if you gave it to me, I would have to say, well, that's valuable. Yeah, you know? that's right. Uh, when you talk about the exchange of Linden dollars for um, real dollars, it brings to mind an analogy of these that this world has uh, to that of a foreign country. And one of the themes of the book, and really the title of the book uh, is part of this, is the idea that people are going to migrate from this world, the real world, to the virtual world. Uh, you call it an exodus to the virtual world, but of course – you don't literally mean that people are going to leave it behind. Right. They're going to spend increasing amounts of time in in that virtual world. Now, when I talk to people about that, they're very skeptical. Uh, most people who are skeptical, though, of course, have never played these games. Right. And um, for me, thinking about it and trying to be open-minded, I'm, some of your predictions, I start thinking about what people must have said about television when it first started. You have this little ugly box in – Right. Maybe a wooden frame. It's twelve inches. The screen's about a foot in diameter, or maybe you know along the diagonal. And it's black and white, and the sound's not so good. And someone says, "You know, in thirty or forty or fifty years, people are going to spend hundreds of hours watching this little box." You'd say, "Oh, come on! It's yeah. you're crazy." But you think that that is going to happen. So make the case for that. And then I want to turn to what the implications of that migration are for this world, which is one of the most interesting parts of the book. So first, make the case. Okay. So we live in an attention economy right now. Let's just start there, where you know value and, and activity, um, our measurements of economic activity really follow the eyeballs. So this isn't really a matter of people picking up a body, a human body, and migrating it to some other point of the earth. Instead, it's, it's a matter of, like, what media are people choosing to devote attention to? So start thinking about it that way. If you think, you know, one, one place you could put your eyeballs is in the real world, and another place is TV, and another one is in the virtual world. All right, so, great. Now, in the virtual world, you've got every aspect of human sociality that, that can be imagined. I mean, you've got markets, and you've got romance, and you've got you know, friendship and power and hierarchy and norms, all of that stuff, politics, all of that is in there because it's a society of real human beings. So it doesn't feel very different once you've actually gone in. And actually, I can say um, I've met plenty of skeptics. I've never met a skeptic of any age or education level or income level who has actually been in one of these worlds. <laughs> once you go in, it hits you between <laughs> the eyes how real it is. It, you know, just the other week, I was at a conference, and this very elderly guy who's a dean of a business school in Alaska, his subject came up, and he just said, well, I can tell you, I have some experience. I'm thinking, yeah, in Alaska, maybe this is what people do for fun. But And he, yeah. and he said, it's very, very real. So anyway, um, so you, you, you imagine that it's, you know, it feels real once you're in there, and then, unlike the real world, you have these developers who have complete freedom to structure that environment however they want. And, you know, since they're profit-seeking corporations, they're going to structure the environment in a way that makes people happy. And I, you know, we don't make the real world on those lines. You know, the real world has kind of evolved to be whatever it is. And um, so, you know, I, I hear people talking about, well, you know, I'm addicted to this game. And they're saying that in a positive way. That means that I am having so much fun in this environment that I just don't have any desire to go anywhere else. And we can say that that's wrong and they shouldn't do it and, and it's terrible. 
But at some level, you have to say, look, if people find the environment more attractive and they choose it, well, you know, that's their choice. So why is it more attractive? Okay, well, we talked about one thing already. It's an economy that's fair. Um, you know, everybody starts out with nothing and makes their way forward. And, you know, for, for people in their 20s and 30s at the bottom of the corporate ladder, that feels really good. Um, it's a community. You know, most people today are uh, pretty isolated. Did, I, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but the modal group of online gamers is actually older women, women in the age group 35 to 50. Not these kind of virtual world games, but kind of casual online games. And, you know, and the reason, they're probably pretty isolated by the pressures of family and suburban life. So they, they just sit down at the computer, boom, instant community. So these kind of environments are providing that, that sort of instant community, and that's another reason people will go. And in the final analysis, I mean, it's really a question of meaning. What about the person who poured the Starbucks latte this morning? You know, what, how does the, the game of the real world feel for them? That, that guy is thinking, let's see, I can be a Starbucks worker or I can be a Starship captain. And I look at that and I say, well, of course, you know, he's going to want to spend at least some time as the Starship captain. And, that, and then I ask myself, well, when is that going to stop? You know, when, when is this, this uh, reward of, of having a significant, meaningful life, being a hero? You know, everybody wants to be a hero. What's going to stop that? You know, what point are people just going to say, no, you know, I'm not interested in being a famous and wonderful, beautiful hero. You know, no, when are people going to stop? And I don't really, I can't really identify an obvious stopping point. And the, the test I always give myself is, um, well, I mean, if they made a perfect fantasy world for me, would I go there? And then all of your listeners can ask themselves that. I mean, think about the, the ideal world. For you, somebody's going to make that world, and the people who see it, things the way you do, are going to be in there. And, and you're going to tell me you're not going to spend even one minute in there, you know. So I, that, that's that's why I think, you know, well, it's not like it's going to be a hundred percent. I'm just saying there are going to be a lot of people spending a lot of time in these places. Well, I want to talk about that last point because I I wrote about this in uh, in my book, The Invisible Heart, mm-hmm. and I was struck by the uh, almost a perfect. Uh, analogy to this issue in one of your chapters, I was talking about uh, Robert Nozick's idea. I call it a dream machine. I don't remember what he calls it in his book. The experience machine. The experience machine. But in the dream machine, which is a little more um, compelling, uh, you would hook yourself up to this machine, and it would be indistinguishable from reality. And while you were on the machine, you would be able to pre-program it to your fantasy. You could become a great athlete, a great rock star, a great politician, perish the thought. Uh, (laughs) But you could become something extraordinary that you fantasize about. And while you're on the machine, it will seem real. And of course, in these virtual worlds, it has a real aspect of reality because there are other real people playing. But of course, that might be not true. You might just be, it'd be hard to distinguish you're uh, eventually, I think it'll be very difficult to distinguish the real people playing in the game versus yes. artificially intelligent players built by those game designers. It's already so, kind of hard. So you're, right, so you're in this game or in this, on this machine, and all your dreams come true. You, you discover the cure for cancer. You, you play f- for the greatest rock band of all time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and in Nozick's version, I think, or at least in the way I discuss it, you, um, when your dream is done, you're dead. You, you know, they unhook you from the machine and they bury you. And I I think – I don't know how many people would want to play that machine. I think what's interesting about this appeal of the virtual world is that to be a great wizard or uh, starship captain at night when you're not doing your uh, job, which isn't exciting, say, um, I understand the appeal of it. But if you immerse yourself in it to the extent that it becomes your reality, which I'm sure it is for many people, it's as you say in the book, the real world is the is the world where they get to go online. That's what they think of as home. That's where they're most comfortable. That's where they get the deepest satisfactions. I, I understand that's possible, but I think many people will have a revulsion against that. Um, part of that will will come from a religious uh, set of of imperatives that I want to maybe talk about if if we have time. But I think a lot of people will find that that migration, that exodus, unpalatable. Do you think that's true? I, I actually I agree with that. So 
the open question to me is, for how many people is this going to be an acceptable sacrifice? So in other words, I accept the loss of physicality, and I'm now going to live in virtuality. How, how many people are going to find that an acceptable trade-off? Um, Lots. I, mean, I, I, should, I, should, <laughs> I should sort of put my cards on the table and say that I think a life devoted to the dream machine is morally wrong, and people shouldn't do that. So, um, th- you know, there's a line beyond which a person should not go, you know, virtual worlding. My only question is how, you know, whatever I personally think that line is, you know, setting that aside, the social science question is how many people are going to go over there? Um, it's And I feel like it's going to be awfully, awfully tempting for a lot of people. And then the question is how many people are going to say, how many, how many people are going to have that wake-up moment of, you know, this just isn't real, it's not right, you know, I want to touch somebody, I, you know. Um, we. I'm sure that when the TV was invented, like you mentioned before, a lot of, you know, people would have said, no, no one, no one will spend eight hours a day sitting on a couch, right? not moving, watching this thing. Because that's so immoral and, and degrading. Right, and, right. But, no one would accept that kind of life. So I accept your point that, that a lot of people will, uh, find the virtual world extremely attractive. And, and I accept even the, I think we have to confront the fact that a lot of us right now spend a lot of time in the virtual world called the internet, yeah. surfing mindlessly. I'm embarrassed by how much time I spend <laughs> just Googling around to look for interesting stuff. Yeah, finding and, these stupid authors. <laughs> right, exactly, for my podcast. And that's serendipitous. You know, I'm just kind of exploring It'd be probably a lot more fun to explore something where people have actually designed it for exploration explicitly to entertain me. So let's accept the truth that many people will find it attractive. What are some of the implications that and competitive pressures, which I think is one of the most interesting parts of the book, what kind of competitive pressure do you think this will put on, on the real world? Well, what I tried to do as I was thinking about that was go back to the pressures that happen when you have a migration in, in the real world. So I tried to think a lot about... You know, what happened to Europe when people went to America? We know a lot of stuff happened to America. But what happened to Europe? The people who didn't even care about America just stayed at home. So there are going to be a lot of people who just say, yeah, virtual world, schmorl, who cares? Um, I, you know, w- the uncomfortable moment is going to be when those folks are, are sharing a voting electorate with these other folks who have just fallen head over heels in love with virtual reality. Um, you know, it's not like those people aren't going to have any interests in the public space. It's not like those virtual world colonists, if you will. It's not like they're going to have no influence whatsoever. Um, a lot of them are going to vote. Um, they're going to have influence on norms. And and uh, I think the, the virtual worlds that they spend all their time in are going to have a dramatic impact on what they think is uh, appropriate policy. And the reason I think it's going to have an impact is because a lot of what goes down in these worlds from the, you know, what comes from the developers is actually public policy making. So if you're a developer and you own a virtual world, you face questions like, well, gee, you know, warriors have ended up getting, they're poorer, you know, they have more poverty, in effect, than wizards. Well, that's not right. You know, we got to help the warriors. And so what do you do? You sort of try to collect interests and figure out what's going on with the warriors, what's going on with the wizards, you know, why is this happening? How can we raise the effective wage rates of warriors without making the wizards mad and you come up with some some change to the rules like because you're a game developer you think it's a change to the rules and you promulgate it you know you put it out there you make it effective in the world and then the people respond and they're angry or sad or whatever um and if they don't like it they leave your game well you know that is so parallel to the job of governing in the real world where you try to figure out why people are mad you try to figure out what to do to change it you you come up with a law that changes it, and then the people are happy or sad, and you know either they leave your state or country or whatever, or they stay there and they vote against you. Um, and, and so it's a very similar process. So somebody growing up in a virtual world is going to get used to this idea that whoever is in charge is making policy. And you're going to say, oh, that's a good policy. You made it so that wizards and warriors are treated equally. Then they go out in the real world, and, and uh, you know, how come... You know, uh, 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 people from Iowa get treated differently from people from Minnesota. That doesn't make any sense. So there's, there's this sort of norm of, like, wage balance, for example, that would be formed in virtual worlds and would come home to roost in the real world. And there are quite a lot of things like that because um, that are weird because the, 
the way they do the, the policy choices they've made in the virtual world are really, really different from what are made in the real world. So there's going to be conflict. I'm not so sure about that, the, the first part, about how different they are. Okay. I, I, I want to take one example, which I really found intriguing, um, which is the role of myth <clears throat> and lore. Okay. Uh, you talked about how we have this uh, incredible longing and I think it's true for myth and lore. And, and one one thing missing from the book, I thought, was an explicit discussion of religion. I think religion potentially could be very threatened by virtual reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because a lot of people find religion makes their life meaningful. Um, yeah. uh, when, you, um, when you're asked what's the purpose of life, if you're a religious person, you say it's to serve God or some variant of that. Yeah. Um, and you ask yourself what would... Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or Buddha do, and that helps guide your life, and complying with that gives you a deep feeling of, of satisfaction for, for most of us who are religious. Some people aren't, still get satisfaction. Some people who are religious don't get satisfaction, but religion plays an important role in, in many of our lives. And you're suggesting in the book, which I found, ex again, extremely intriguing, that you know, living in, say, Middle Earth, uh, Tolkien's version of reality, vision of uh, of a myth is comforting to people it is yeah. it is a source of of um of great uh meaning yeah. and w i want you to try to make the case for that and then i want to talk about what how the real world re will respond to that i think potentially the real world has lots of myths um you know different ones some of them are religious some of them are about the nature of our countries mm -hmm. we have lots of lore in our life it's interesting to me that we don't really promulgate that lore very well anymore. Yeah. I don't know whether that's out of guilt or uh, disillusionment, uh, but but clearly there is something comforting about the role of myth and lore in these virtual worlds. So talk about that. And for me, the question is whether the real world could respond with its own lore, can come back that way. Yeah. Well, first, I, I want to say that kind of stuff is only touched on in the book because when I think about it, the thoughts I get are just so incendiary that, you know, I, I work at a public state institution and, you know, to, to be talking about religion so frankly is a, is a difficult thing. So I'm actually gearing up to, toward writing an essay on this sort of topic. Let me sort of sketch out the ideas. Um, so you're right. I think it, it is an important question that what's going on in virtual worlds in terms of myth and lore sort of quasi-religion, you know, the fact that that is competitive with and attractive to people in ways that real-world religion, myth, and lore are not is a, a pretty uh, serious condemnation of the, the state of things in the real world. Um, we have obviously, you know, we all humans have wrestled with the question of religion for the past 500 years, and, uh, you know, and even in the contemporary political election, Right? Yeah, it's a big issue. Election. It's just there are people who are saying that we shouldn't even be talking about this, and other people who are saying, you know, there's only one way to do this. And um, and I just think that we haven't found a healthy answer, the answer that humans need. And what's going on in the virtual world is certainly comforting to people. In fact, we could talk about Middle Earth. So Tolkien invents Middle Earth, and um, this is before virtual world, this is back in the um, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Primitive device called a book. Yeah, in a, in a book. And he actually, he made the argument in an essay that a book was really the only place you could make a virtual world before even knowing what virtual worlds were technologically um, speaking. So uh, so he makes it in a book, and um, he actually, it turns out, if you read some of his essays sort of around his project, that was the whole point was to say, look, the modern world has so messed up the concept of religion and myth and left us in kind of this barren wasteland where it's, it's you know, kind of a Walt Disney version of religion on one side and this sort of cold atheism on the other. And he said, you know, hum humans have always lived in a pretty rich traditional environment of myth. I'm going to just try and make one. And and I know it's, you know, he, he was a Roman Catholic, so he's like, I'm not going to try and make, you know, Roman Catholic world. I'll, I'm just going to try, let's, let's get the low-hanging fruit here. Let's just go back to good and evil. <laughs> you know? And you know, I think that's an incredibly deep insight. Yeah, the human, and, the human hunger 
for good guys and bad guys, good and yeah. evil. It's a deep, deep thing, whether it comes from God or somewhere or right. our evolutionary past. is and, It's and clearly you can, there. And you can grant to the people who say, you know, religion has been the single greatest cause of death. It's like, well, that's true. Just because I'm interested in good and evil, you know, there's no reason to go around killing other people. But it speaks to this hunger that folks have to be a hero and to act in a world in a way that promotes goodness. And so along come these video games, and in every one of them, there's some sort of Tolkien thing. There's a thing with green skin and sharp teeth that roars, and, and then there are people, these yeah. you know, noble humans who, and elves who go off and fight those things. And, um, you know, it, it seems to me that, that I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that what's in the video games is the answer. It's not human salvation religiously, but it is a powerful aesthetic. It's a powerful argument. And it, it's basically, it's saying to the folks who run things, the people at the top of churches, the people at the top of governments, and especially people in universities, you know what? you got to fix this thing. <laughs> this thing, well, people are hungry and they need more of this thing. Well, yeah, I'm a big fan of religion, so I don't, ha- I don't share the, the view that says uh, it's the source of, of, well, of do I. death and all that, although I understand the, the argument for it. Mm-hmm. I think religion is a great... And, and glorious thing, and the fact is that religions compete with each other like yeah. uh, other other institutions. And uh, Larry Anacone was in an earlier podcast talked about that, which I recommend. Mm-hmm. But I, the fact that they compete has many good things about it and some not so good things. So I don't think we're ever going to get it right any any more than these different virtual worlds will get it right. What clearly serves the users of these worlds well is the fact that they have to compete against each other, mm-hmm. and. Let me let me move it away from religion, though, and, and talk about, say, capitalism. I'm a big fan of capitalism. You're probably, I think, a little less of a fan, it just seems, yeah. from reading the book. But yeah. generally, I think it, it has served humans well. I find it interesting that we have virtually no lore about capitalism, that we don't invest it with any romance. I and mean, I spend some of my time trying to create some romance around capitalism because I think it deserves more than it has – certainly doesn't deserve an infinite amount or to be a religion, but it's striking to me that we once had that lore. Um, if anything, capitalism works better than ever, and yet we feel guilty talking about it in inspiring ways. I find that interesting, and I, and I think the, the insights in your book about how production happens and cooperation – uh, suggest maybe that we could do a better job talking about capitalism and economic activity. I agree. Let me first of all, going way back twenty years. You know, the first department I was in, University of Rochester. There was a guy named John Mueller, and he came to me once and he said, "Is there any example in literature or movies of a business person who was not a bad guy?" Yeah, no, I think about that a lot. Right, yeah. and and I really I rack my There's brain. A couple. You know, the, the idea of of you know, building a business, which is an exciting and difficult prospect filled with risk and everything, is never taken up as any kind of a literary theme. It used to be a little bit. In, there, there's some novels yeah. of the 19th century. In the right. movie world, in American culture, um, you have uh, The Miracle on 34th Street, which suggests that it's good business to help your customers become well-informed even about competitors. And then you have about a three-minute section in Sabrina – uh, but not the, not the remake, of course, the original. The Humphrey Bogart, um, William Holden version, Humphrey Bogart gets accused of being a dirty businessman instead of something noble, and he gets like a 90-second speech, maybe three minutes, to defend why he makes the world a better place. But that's about it, as far yeah. as I can tell. I, there's not much else. Uh, you, know what, you know what this guy Mueller did? He went out and investigated P.T. Barnum. Yeah, no, it's, he, I've read that. Yeah, it, it, you know, it turns out P.T. Barnum was the most honest. <laughs> He's got a terrible, guy. unfair reputation yeah. as a swindler. It's a terrible thing. So, uh, um, so, anyway, so how, how does this relate to virtual worlds? I think that the lore of um, production in a virtual world, and this doesn't really come out in the book, is likely to cause an upswing in capitalism. I mean, one of the things I did mention was um, uh, what I view as a, a strong support for libertarian um, distribution policies, which is that if you start everybody at zero wages, nobody cares that income inequality happens. Nobody seems to be in favor of ex post income reallocation so long as um, the opportunities are roughly equally distributed. 
And I think that's a, that's a powerful case for the American approach to social welfare policy, which is to try and even the starting line rather than have a huge state that redistributes income. So, um, well, we're so less like Europe anyway. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, exactly. As we can discuss yeah. how much it actually <laughs> is. Um, but um, so that's one thing. But um, the other part is the the way that employment is structured. Most people are virtually everybody is self employed in a virtual world. When they think about let's set up an economy, the the notion of collective organization, of corporate forms of organization, of factories and so on, is really, with the exception of one or two worlds, it's just not considered. Everybody is an owner-operator. You go, you find your resources either in the ground or you buy them online once you get some capital. Then you make stuff, and then you sell that, that stuff on the auction house. And, and it's, it's you. you. You work when you want. You work when you need money. Everybody's an artisan. Everybody <laughs> is an artisan. And so you know, maybe the situation – everybody would love capitalism if it could have a pre-industrial form of organization. The problem and, is the water's not so clean. You die young, and yeah, uh, yeah. the medicine, the medical care is not very good. Exactly. So the problem is, is that specialization, the division of labor, produced the standard of living that allows right. you to have the computer that so you can play World of Warcraft. Right. Right. So that's exactly. you, you got to be careful. As you point, you point that out in the book. Yeah, it's like we, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen to um, the, the global economy as a result of some of these changes, but I certainly see that, that this form of production in virtual worlds is saying. Um, to the real world, it's saying, you know what, people really do want to be um, self-dependent. They, they really want to be able to, uh, you know, set their own schedule and do their own, do their own thing. Um, and so forms of, and I know people in the business community now are starting to worry about this. Now they're going to get a bunch of 20-somethings who expect to be paid the way you get reinforcement in a video game. In a video game, you get reinforcement Every you know twenty seconds, you know, I killed an orc. Ding, you know, I get five gold pieces. Nobody runs a business like that. But, but there's this growing concern about you know how do we socialize the twenty somethings that they got to work hard for a year and then they get a bonus if they're lucky. Well, I, you have an interesting example though in the book of a of an organization <clears throat> that would work cooperatively. Uh, we're going to have a podcast coming up soon on the theory of the firm, and we'll get into some more of this uh, soon. But or it may end up being last week. I don't know. I'm not sure when this is going to actually run. But um, we could imagine a cooperative activity taking place within an or in the virtual world, which I think you said takes place now, where people are kind of paid by their contribution in a measurable way. And that that could be more of a model for actual real-world firms than we use now. I think the problem is measurability is the, is the problem. Yeah, I mean, well, the only reason that this um, artisan economy works in the virtual world is because you can set things up that way, that that um, the entire production process can be sort of dominated by one individual. So in any, and, you know, and they make it so that that's the most efficient way to do things. So in the real world, obviously, you can't run a, a delivery service with, you know, one person doing everything, you know, collecting the package from the customer and putting it on a truck and driving it somewhere. You can't do that. So then... The, yeah, the real issue is going to be how do you um, how do you measure value added on an individual level? Yeah, if we got paid five gold pieces for every lecture we gave, right? The problem exactly. would be the keeping quality constant and right. Um, in fact, they didn't. The, the PhD hood has a hole in it, a little pocket in it, because you used to walk out of the lecture hall and they drop a gold piece in if they liked the lecture. You know, I wouldn't make a lot of money <laughs> in that kind of a system. People teaching calculus would be very poor. Yeah, I don't know. It's um, <laughs> that's a whole other question. Um, yeah. But the, my point is always with all of these things. Though my point is not that this is the way to do it or one way is better, but the pressure to do something like this is going to be there. I want to talk about a different kind of pressure, which I think is more interesting than what we've touched on yet, which is the role of fun. And I, the there's a lot of interesting uh, thoughts in the book about fun versus happiness versus deeper satisfaction and the implications it might have for the provision of government services. And uh, so talk about how fun works. In fact, what I'd really like you to talk about it is the story of Fred, because uh, I thought it had a nice application to how um, we as economists think about the world. And if you remember it well enough, if you don't, I can find it in the book. But you talk about Fred. Fred wants to get a car right. and he wants to... Tr- trade stocks 
earn enough money to buy a car and then put a a, a license plate on the car that's or a bumper sticker that says, "Do you remember?" Yeah, no, I remember. Right. Um, What's the line? Uh, paid for by the IRS. No, or, no, paid for by Dow Jones, right? Yeah, yeah, that's Bra- right. Brought to you by Dow Jones. Yeah, brought to you by Dow Jones. So he wants right. to earn enough money in this trading activity to buy a car. So uh, explain how the government ruins that sometimes. Well, okay, so let's say you, you set it as a personal goal for yourself that you were going to achieve you know, a certain level of income. And then uh, in traditional public policy analysis, we might do a survey and discover you, and you'd say, I'm unhappy. And say, Why are you unhappy? Well, I set this goal for myself that I'm going to earn $25,000 and buy a car. And, uh, well, do you have your 25000 No, I, I don't have it yet, and that's why I'm unhappy. So what we tend to do as, as public policy economists, we go, well, there's this individual with a problem. We can raise his utility by giving him the $25,000. So you go ahead and you cut the check, you know, take somebody else's tax money, and you give it to the guy. And um, Now he's got the car. He's got the car, but he's not happy. It's like, why is he not happy? It's because... He had a personal goal of getting it through his own work, his own sweat. And now he's got the car, but it just doesn't feel so good. And there's some evidence of this kind of stuff. And like, uh, there are these old papers where um, it turns out that uh, people value a dollar of welfare money at less than one dollar's worth. Uh, in other words, if you gave them the choice between a dollar of welfare money and a dollar of income, they'll take the income. That that makes them feel better. And and you know, all of this is pointing to the to a problem I see with economics not really understanding the source of human satisfaction. That we haven't really we haven't built our, our models of choice um, on the basis of the way the brain actually functions, like with all of its different modules and all this stuff that, that neuroscientists know about. We haven't done that. We've just sort of said, well look, rational people are going to pursue their goals and if you get closer to their goals, they're not going to care how they get closer to their goals. They're just they just want to get closer. And so we have a government that just says, let's say, um, well, these these people need electricity. Here, here's a bunch of electricity. And then, then, you know, are the people happier or not? We well, don't if, really know because we don't really, measure the happiness. Right, but if you're really cold at night, you really like that electricity, Absolutely. and you may not care. Uh, but but the deeper point, which I think is very real, is that our standard models of consumer behavior ignore the route. They ignore the journey. They ignore the yeah. the way we get there. And I, uh, two thoughts. To quote Gerard Manley Hopkins, the poet, he's, he has a great line in a poem where he says, I am my work, for that I came. And, you know, there's a – that tension that we have between work as something we suffer through to get the toys we want versus a source of meaning is something that economists don't have much to say about, no. in, in my opinion. And, and we, we should think about it more because it's very important. Well, I, I would actually say – for, until now, we, we've had sort of a, the luxury of saying, well, it doesn't really matter because, you know, people have got to work and, <laughs> and it's not like there's an alternative world out there where they build an economy based on fun and people can just go there. So that's how it's been. But now that world does exist. <laughs> you know, you have this artisan economy sitting over there where they pay a lot of attention to the root and they, they pay a lot of attention to, um, you know, I am my work and, and these sorts of things. And you know what what happens if people say you know I earn less money in the virtual world but I find it more satisfying so I, I'm going to devote my eyeballs there. So for those of us who haven't experienced that world, what do you think the source of that meaning and satisfaction is? When, when you, and I, and talk about fun in this context. This yeah. this idea of is it is it just the the positive reinforcement? Is it the achievement? Is there prestige in these worlds? What's going on that makes them fun? And um, so appealing. Well, okay, so the game industry is figuring out the human brain in, in ways that are kind of unfathomable to me. It seems like every week they've discovered some new way of, of building a game that, that makes people just kind of obsessive with doing it. So I, I, no, nobody has really gone through trying to figure out on a theoretical level what they're doing. So let me just sketch something out. It's very speculative. My view of what's going on in terms of fun in the video game industry is um, it's about uh, really, really deep motivations in the brain. So if you think about human beings running around in savanna, there are two motivational systems. One is called appetitive. That is, I see a resource. I see, like, you know, juicy fruit, and I want to go eat it. That's the, the word is appetitive yeah. with the root of appetite. For the, it's hard to hear for folks, but that's, having right. read the book, that appetitive. 
Right, yeah. So it's like appetite-related. Think of it as positive. So it's positive reinforcement. And then there's a negative one, aversive motivation, where if I see a saber-toothed tiger, I better run away. And uh, people who study the brain, like I have a colleague here, Annie Lang, in my department, you know, have found that, that your entire body gets energized by these systems. And the thing that's really interesting about what she's found is that they don't operate um, dependently. They're actually independent. So you could be motivated on both of them at the same time. And I think what makes video you know, like, games fun, Like trying, trying to get at a fruit tree protected by a saber-toothed tiger. Exactly. And that is actually when you are in the most tense and energized state is, is when something like that is going on. Um, it only becomes fun, however, if you invoke another module, which is called the play module. So think about this. You can't talk to your dog, but you can play with your dog, which tells you how deep in the brain this fundamental motivation to just play around is. And so if you think about motivation, motivating those two systems in some way, when people know it's just playing around, that appears to me to be what the most fun is. So that's why you know, if you had a video game and all that people did was wander around and pick up gold pieces, that, that would be kind of, oh, it's interesting for a while, but not that interesting. Or if you had one where people ran around and they just got chased by dragons all the time, that would be interesting for a while, but it would get frustrating. If you put the two of them together, you put the dragon on top of gold pieces, now you're on to something. And I think what they do is they set up that basic situation so you're very motivated, and then what they do is they sort of ramp it. So you start out with a, like a weak dragon and a lot of gold pieces, and then they, they, they make it so everybody knows how many gold pieces you've got, so you're trying to get more and more. And the gold piece pile is kind of you know, getting harder and harder to get. It's taking more and more time. You're getting better and better at playing the game. And you're ramping up, and it's a bunch of people, so you're all like, oh, I'm in fourth place. I'm in fifth place for my level. And, and, um, and, they, they, and in getting you involved in that system, then they start making you feel slow which a lot of people in business understand is like, that is like the optimal psychological state. You're not overstressed, but you're not understressed. You've got some system that's, that's uncertain, but you've got control over it. You've just got to focus on it, and you're moving towards some positive outcome. And basically the game industry is figuring out through this fun stuff to, to keep you in a state of flow pretty much perpetually. And I think that's why it's, it's really attractive to people. Yeah, I want to read... A lengthy passage from the book, not too lengthy, but somewhat lengthy. Okay. I hope it's good. <laughs> well, there, I, I, I was looking for one, and there are a few to choose from that I love. There are quite a few interesting ones. I want to take this one because it just came up in your remarks about addiction. Um, here's what you say about uh, addiction <clears throat> and this complaint that people have somehow that games are addictive and therefore they're dangerous. And so you write this. Among gamers, I sense a complete and utter dismissal of the concerns voiced by game regulation advocates. In response to objections to violence, gamers roll their eyes. A similar reaction is given to the sentence, games are addictive. Gamers generally have no respect whatsoever for such statements. They do not perceive them as fair and well-informed commentary. Rather, they consider anyone who says such a thing thoroughly out of touch, not because gamers are addicted themselves, but because the term addiction does not begin to capture the nature of the compulsion Many feel, many feel toward games and virtual worlds. Consider a sentence like, a mother's love is addictive. You bet it is. No one can get enough of it. Anyone who isn't addicted to mother's love is a fool or extremely damaged in some way. Not to be addicted to a mother's love is a bad, bad thing. I think these sentiments are similar to those felt by people who have experiences inside virtual worlds that are so rich, so deep, so meaningful that their experiences in the real world pale in comparison. A person who's had the experience of both worlds and found the virtual world one so much better ought to return. In such a case, our complaints should be levied on the real world for providing such a poor experience. People who love virtual worlds react to those who don't understand their attraction. The way lovers of architecture attract to the Boers who consider the Cathedral of Reims some big old church. In a building like the Cathedral of Reims, something indescribably sublime pervades the atmosphere, something ethereal, transcendent, divine. Though intangible, it is real. Most people feel it. Some feel it very, very strongly. Others don't feel it at all, but it is there. A sentence like, some people are addicted to these big old churches, reveals deep ignorance of a cathedral's impact on a visitor. Virtual worlds are not cathedrals, but they do transport people to another plane. 
They have a compelling positive effect on visitors, an effect dramatically misunderstood by many of those who have never spent time there. So you've just given us a little, end of quote, so you've given us a little bit of flavor of why it might be compelling, the idea of being in the flow. Yeah. Those of us who are athletes, not me, but people who are athletic, <laughs> <Me either. laughs> people who are athletic experience that when they play their weekly tennis game, if they're yeah. lucky, or when they pretend to be um, part of their NFL team, their football team, yeah. and they call it my Patriots, our mm-hmm. team, when in fact we don't play for them, but we have that excitement and, and loss of self and yeah. immersion into that experience that, that is called fun. And I think the what, the what the virtual world potential is there is to create that fun in an ongoing way uh, that is that is social and interactive. But is it is it is that is that am I getting at it? Is that what yeah. we're talking about? I mean that's that sounds very much like the the way an intelligent person would describe the feeling they had if they actually went in there. You know, once if you actually go in and you find something that hooks you, you come out and you say, I, I can't, I, I just did not understand that. It, it's there's so it, it's so real in some sense. It's so much more real than it looks like on the outside. I mean, the same way if you looked at a cathedral on the outside and you're not a religious person, you walk in, you walk out, you get nothing out of it. But some people, it's just it's transcendent. indescribable feeling. So you're suggesting that these virtual worlds can be transcendent in some dimension for the players. Yeah, in some way, they, in the sense that they take them out of whatever reality is and put them in another place. Um, and so, tech, you know, in the direct definition of what transcendence is. Um, yeah, that would do it. Yeah. Uh, this aspect of play, which again, when I, I think when people think about this who haven't been in these worlds, we tend to think, oh, that's just, that's childish. But, but there's no doubt that there's already a tremendous pressure on the real world to be more playful and more fun. Yeah. Uh, it's not, not simply because, of, not, not at all probably because of this competition from the virtual world, but simply right. because it is an important part of what makes us human. And as we get wealthier, we can afford more play than right. we had before. Yeah, I think there's there's tension in human resources, for example, between the you know business's serious model and the you know let's have fun and release our creative juices model. Mm-hmm. I think any manager probably bops back and forth between those two. Any teacher of students, I'm sure you know anybody who's taught students realizes sometimes you get the best out of them when you when you really ride them. And, and just really tell them this isn't fun, this is awful, this is horrible. And other times you get the best out of them by um, saying, let's just kick back and relax. And you see it with sports teams. So, um, you know, I, I think there is pressure in the real world to try and understand human motivation. And it's, it, I think the, the, the really simple statement of, well, you know, anything fun can't be serious, so let's not do anything fun, is is pretty misguided. I think that the... the the best thing to do is to figure out where you know where does fun make humanity better, make our lives better, and where is it a distraction and destructive? And I think every person is going to have to find that line, and it's going to get hard. You know, as you know, you know people lose themselves to the internet. I know when when I first <laughs> when I first got internet access in '94 or something, I lost two weeks. I mean, it just they just went away, hmm. um, and you know, for other people, it, it continues. So everybody's we're going to have such a garden of delights, I think, going forward. The digital media is going to provide such wonderful things. And we're all going to have to get into this conversation about the you know, meat space versus virtual space and, and where do we draw the line. Well, I'm thrilled to hear you use the word meat space because that's <laughs> a word I use when I talk about language as an emergent phenomenon that's the result of human action but not human design yeah. and that meat space didn't catch on. Uh, it, it means... The flesh and blood world, but yeah. most people don't know it. And it, it, you're one of the last users, Dad. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm excited okay. to hear it. It's, it's a good word. There it is. Yeah. It has some value. Yeah. Um, hang on, I, I lost my train of thought. I'm going to come back. Um, my meat space uh, diversion uh, got me lost. One sec. What are we talking about? We're talking about. Um, uh, what were you just saying? Uh, what was I talking about? I was I was um, talking about the tensions in human resources and businesses about um, you know whether to make work serious or make work fun, work fun, and that ultimately we're all going to have to make those kind of judgments about how much of this kind of fun to have in our in our daily lives and how much 
of you know reality to have. Okay, well, I, I I've lost it, but it doesn't matter. We'll we'll uh, we'll come, but we won't come back to it. If if I think of it, I'll mention it again. But a um, couple more topics, and then then we'll okay. we'll be out of time. Um, you talk about feature creep, a very entertaining um, comparison when you compare feature creep among game designers and how competition restrains it versus uh, government, which yeah. is more of a monopoly. What do you mean by feature creep, and what can we learn from it? So within the game industry, there's this statement that the, the most dangerous phrase is, wouldn't it be cool if? Because in order to make a good piece of software, you need to identify a small core group of features and then implement them and polish them so that they're fixed. They really work well. And that's a lot of the work is that polish. And when you're making a game, I mean, any of, any of your readers could sit there and imagine, like I said before, their virtual fa- ideal fantasy and then say, and if we had that, wouldn't it be cool if it had that? Wouldn't it be cool if it had that? And um, this kills a lot of game projects. Because, why, why is that? Well, because um, it's no fun to play a game that has a whole bunch of poorly implemented and unpolished features. You know, if, let's say uh, 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 the people designing it really love leopards, and so at the last minute they put leopards into the game, and it turns out the leopards are so fearsome and awful that they kill everybody right away. Right, there's a, lot the of, there's a lot of interaction. It's a little bit like, it's easier for me to understand when you talk about uh, devices. You know, wouldn't yeah. it be great if my phone had a, a pocket calculator built into it with a, with a tape that, could, that right. could, it could print out stuff? And so everything's mediocre. And instead, what you really want is the best yeah. phone in the world or the best this. And the iPhone's an interesting yeah. example of an attempt that aesthetically is so pleasing and the interface maybe is so good that it's okay that it does more than one thing. But most of the time, we want one yeah. thing or a few things done really well. I mean, ask yourself, what would you pay to have a car that would go on water? You know, I'm sure that when back in the day, I mean, they, they were talking about cars that would fly even. But, you know, if, if uh, General Motors sat down and said, we're going to make a, water, a car that will go on water, and then they try to do it, and they, they said, but, you know, the price point can't be more than $20,000, that's going to be a crappy car and a crappy boat, too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. so, uh, so this feature creep is a real problem, and it's got to be restrained. Um, it, and the way, the way things work in the game development and virtual world is, They'll come up with some ideas about what they want to do, and then they implement them on a test server, and they test them with actual live people for a long time, and then they finally decide this worked, this didn't, let's perfect this and, and put it in. Um, Real-world governments, you know what they do. They, they get together and say, hey, this would be a good idea, and then without any testing or anything, they just, bam, just, there it is, that's the law. And, you know, years later, everybody says, whoa, that, that really wasn't a good idea. You know, can we please reform this? <laughs> and they want to solve every problem, right? And, whether they're right. good at it or not, right? And that's right. I mean, so I mean, we're going to go through this period of uh, elections that drives me crazy. You know, every town hall meeting. Well, I have a problem. You know, my neighbor's tree is over. Well, we should have a federal law. <laughs> and, and you never hear you never hear a candidate say, "You know, I just don't think the government should do anything about that." That's your problem. Yeah, that's a rare uh, <laughs> phrase. Uh, in fact, I don't think it's been said much since about 1870. Yeah. I, it's interesting why that is. Uh, maybe that gets back to our lore question as to what we've come to expect of government. And, well, um, I would say it's, it's a lack of vision and understanding of their role. I'm talking about the real-world government now because the developers, they're in a heavily competitive environment with other developers, and they know, they are confident that if they reduce the feature set and make sure that the features they release are good, that they will retain their citizens. And wouldn't it be interesting to have a government that actually said that, you know, we're not going to solve every problem, but the problems we address are going to be solved. And, and is there a government out there that's willing to take that leap and say, we believe our voters will be happier with us? You know, and here's an example of something like that. Remember, uh, you know, those of you who were around, 1980 and the switch to monet- monetarist um, monetar- monetary policy uh, when Volcker came in as the chair of the Federal Reserve Board, they said, we know it's going to set off a recession, but this pattern of just, you know, cranking up the money supply to try to keep an unemployment down, it's just, this isn't, you know, I know this is what you guys say you want. You're going to be happier if we put in monetary discipline. They put in monetary discipline, and we've had pretty much a good ride since 1980, more or less, much better than what was going on before. And so it's that kind of courage that we all wish our politicians would have right now. Well, and the Paul developers Volcker, have it. 
Well, it's a different, of course, competitive pressure on politicians varies tremendously by yeah. system and jurisdiction. I think one of the lessons of the, of, of the book, which you, I don't think you talk about, is, is making migration easier. So one of the virtues of, of the virtual world is it's easy to go in and it's, it's pretty easy to go out. Yeah. Um, it, it's not trivial to enter, as, I, as we've talked about. You have to buy the game and you have to learn the rules and there's a learning curve. And once you've learned it, I assume you get better at playing other games as well, but you still have to learn a new game. But that's the, comp- that's the competitive pressure on these designers is that people either switch to a new game or just drop out. Uh, for governments, voting with your feet at the local level is, is pretty easy. Vot- right. going acro- voting with your feet across national lines is a lot harder. Right. So if that were easier and there were more alternatives that were attractive, that would restrain politicians yeah. from feature creep, and that's just not happening. Well, actually, but now it is happening because people can leave reality. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that this might be the competitive moment for real-world governments. It, there is this possibility that virtual worlds could become sovereign states, and here's how it could happen. is um, If they adopt a good peer-to-peer technology. So basically what I'm saying is instead of the virtual world living on a central server, which could be controlled potentially by a real-world government, the virtual world could sort of exist as a a, a distri- distributed database on a whole bunch of different computers, and you know you can't you can't ever kill that world because you could you could confiscate a hundred thousand computers PCs, and the database and the functions and the processes and the code would live on in other ones, and in that case you just would never be no no real world government could ever control what's going on there. Can we put it on Mars? Or you know. We need to put it on Mars. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, if you could look at look at these file sharing networks. Can't get a handle on them. Well, that's true. So if if um if that ever happens, there's this possibility these things could be sovereign, and then you, and then you know you can't control people what they do in their rooms. They just sit there. They'll log in, and they just, they not they won't even vote anymore. They're just not going to vote. In the real the problem is, is you do need the um the real world productivity to buy the computer to. Get the software to pay the monthly payments, feed your face, which yeah. you still have to do. Um, right. Keep you warm, keep the heat going. Yeah. Uh, but, but as you point out may, in the book, may, maybe um, we'll do less of some of the sillier materialistic things we do, and focus more on sitting in that at that computer, yeah. which which some people find alarming. And I think you do a nice job talking about why it's not as scary. So, so for some people, all these weirdos, mm-hmm. these techno geeks sitting at their computers and and they're wandering through different universes. Ah, it's scary. It's weird. It's too peculiar. But there's some cheerful thoughts about it. You have? Well, uh, you know, we've talked about it already a lot, that it can be uplifting to the human spirit for people to go out and, and do something heroic, you know, because they don't really have the opportunity to do it in reality. Um, I also think that one of the unfortunate um, outcomes of, of our contemporary you know, economic way of doing things People follow the money, they get a better job, and they move. And so, you know, most families, it seems to me, are, are pretty busted up. They're sort of scattered all over the map. And in these virtual worlds, you can kind of get together. I know uh, this isn't in the book because it didn't happen then, but my wife, who I never have pressured to be involved with this stuff, has started to play um, the game Lord of the Rings online with a girlfriend. The reason she plays with this woman is um, we were all living in Bloomington, Indiana, and we had kids and everything, and so their family moved away. And to stay connected, you could always pick up the phone. But when you pick up the phone, you can't have four people talking. But in a virtual world, everybody can talk to everybody else. And, and, and you can kill a dragon. And kill a dragon. <laughs> so it's not just, you know, is your kid sick? So it's, it's, you hear my wife and this woman talking, playing, and I can hear. And she's like, okay, let's kill this orc and do this quest. And then, you know, oh, I had a terrible time with, you know, my, my, my kid's school teacher. And they talk about that, for, and, and so you know, it's it's actually it's a technology that that's um, bringing people together. Uh, or, you know, how about exercise? Here's another one of the yeah. bright spots about this is, um, you know, everybody says, well, video games are going to make my kids fat, and I, I got news for everybody: the TV is what made us all fat. If you've then, ever played the Nintendo Wii, you get up. I, I have talked to students who come in with sore muscles from playing with their their Wii because you get up off the couch and you move around. And so I could imagine the future of virtual worlds where there'd be this physical exercise mode. You feel 
kind of worn out in your chair, and they say, well, you've got to pick up your sword now and start swinging it around, or the orc is going to get you. Or you'll run through the woods, you'll be on a treadmill, and you'll have to right. actually run, and how fast you run will determine mm-hmm. whether you get away. Yep. I, yep. I think, again, I, I suspect a lot of listeners are thinking this is absurd, and part of me definitely, <laughs> a part of me feels that it is as well. Yeah, but the ability of the human mind to creatively take technology and make it uh, transporting, transcendent, inspirational. Um, the book really is the first one. I mean, we, I, I think you can argue that just as we lose ourselves in a novel, which is really stupid. I mean, I cry over lots of endings yeah. of, of books, yeah. physically cry, and you can say, well, well that's dumb. It's just a bunch of fictional characters. We cry at movies, yeah. and I can see us caring about these things in ways that um, seem absurd, but it, yeah. it might happen. Well, I think to avoid hype, I just, I just keep my eyes on the numbers. And just over the past three years, I've been pretty skeptical, and the numbers have far exceeded what I thought was going to happen. And so that's, that's what motivated me to write the book. It's just going faster than I, even I thought it was going to go. My guest today has been Edward Castronova, Associate Professor in the Department of Telecommunications at Indiana University. We've been talking about Exodus to the Virtual World. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was fun. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.